Welcome to another edition of Take a Stand TV with your host, Christian apologist, author, and speaker, Eric Barger. You can subscribe to our updates and find Eric online at ericbarger.com. Now, here's Eric Barger. Hello, everybody. Eric Barger here, and welcome to Take a Stand TV. Now, as we live stream today, it is Tuesday, July 4th, 2017. It's Independence Day here in the United States. And as you might have guessed by some of the music that I was playing in our building up to beginning the actual content of the program, we always do a live stream coming notice, put it on the screen so people know that the live stream is, is happening or going to happen. We want to make sure everything down the line on the internet gets connected before we actually start the content. So that's why I do that. Um, I, I know this sounded pretty patriotic, and uh, that's because I love my country and because of what today is. Uh, we are a blessed nation as Americans, and I'm grateful to God to be an American, especially in the day that we live in today, living here at the end of the end times, and watching all of these events ramp up that tells us that Jesus is coming soon. With all that said, I'm once more going to interrupt my own schedule, my own plans, and I'm going to air part of my teaching that was, it was recorded five years ago called The Rise, Fall, and Redemption of America. And uh, I'm going to break this up into two segments this morning. That's something else that we've never done. I'm going to break it up into two segments and play those, air those back to back this morning and again this evening starting at 7 o'clock in the evening Pacific time here in the United States. So we'll do the same tonight. And as always... Uh, our programming is, is going to be loaded up to our YouTube channel as soon as possible. Uh, if you don't have time to write down the address that is there on the screen right now, just search for Eric Barger inside of YouTube and you will find our channel and be able to see all of the content of these two programs that will be uh, put up today as well as, of course, all the past programs of Take a Stand TV and other videos that we've done in the past before we started doing a regular broadcast. Uh, also, my travel schedule next week uh, is a little bit crazy, and uh, I'm going to live stream on Monday, July 10th, instead of on Tuesday, on Monday the 10th, same times, 9 in the morning Pacific and 7 in the evening Pacific, and I'll be airing part two of the Purpose Driven Division next week. Uh, it's a recent interview I did with Pastor Brandon Holthouse of Rock Harbor Church in Bakersfield, California. If you missed last week's interview with Kevin Inman, you need to go to YouTube and see that. And of course, you need to tune in next week and see Brandon's uh, interview with me. I think these are very telling. The Purpose Driven Life, Purpose Driven Church, the whole Purpose Driven Philosophy has uh, many problems and uh, hopefully it'll be a warning to you and information to you. And uh, it'll be a blessing for those who need to hear that particular information. All right. I believe God has a specific purpose and plan for every individual living. And I believe he has a specific purpose and plan for every nation on the earth as well. And you're going to hear me talk about America in that way this morning. Now, I believe that back in the summer of 2001, when I first recorded and shot this material or the beginning stages of it to the old VHS videos that we used to watch. And I believe it just as much today, and certainly I did five years ago when I actually shot, actually shot the video that we're going to take part of this teaching from this morning. I realize there are some out there, even some Americans, even some American Christians that might mock and laugh at a statement like I've just made. But uh, this is mentioned early on in the footage, so this is not a new thought for me. It's something I've always believed, that God has a specific plan for nations and for peoples. And uh, you'll see when I begin the message, I make a statement very similar to what you just heard. But I'll let history judge whether I'm right or whether they're right. And I hope if we disagree that we can re remain civil toward one another and uh, that we can just agree to disagree. Uh, as the hostility toward America seems to ramp up more and more around the world, as well as right here in our streets, I believe that a reminder of who we are as a people and what God has done to bring us together as a nation is in order. 
uh, you're going to hear me make two intrinsic reasons or give two reasons why I believe God hasn't allowed our country to collapse long ago. So take note of those reasons during the message when they come up later on. Uh, I believe it's very telling why God still has us here on the planet as he does as a as a nation. Uh, God tells us that nations rise and fall. The Bible is very clear about that, as do their leaders. And, of course, we are called as Christians to pray for our leaders, for all who are in authority, it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2. So pray for them. Pray for our leaders. Uh, God has a plan, and he allows things to take place. Uh, you know, much of what we see in the world today causes us to question that. It causes us to tremble at times. Because we see some things going on that, of course, are very, very disturbing to us. But not one single solitary event is outside of the hand of Creator God. He is still on the throne, and He is in charge. So regardless of how grateful I am to wear the name American, let me also make a quick point that my eternity is not based on my citizenship here on the earth or my nationality. It is based only on the relationship I have with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and that's what eternity is all about. So that's my comment and uh, commentary here for the beginning of this program. And now let's see part one of the rise, fall, and redemption of America. There are people who fatalistically would say, what do you mean redemption? We're not going to be saved. There are people who have already written America off. I'm talking about Americans who live here. There are people who are almost here in America, you know, hoping against hope, hoping against us as a nation. Well, I'm not ready to give up on America yet. Right. God hasn't sounded the trumpet yet. And there's a very practical reason, a couple of them I'm going to give you in a minute, why we are still here as a nation. This isn't a rah, rah, let's all be patriotic thing, although that might happen in your heart as you listen to this. No, this is for a different reason I'm talking about it, because I believe God has a plan going on here. And I think if we understand that plan, we'll be more apt to be able to operate correctly. First and foremost, I'm a believer. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I know where I'm going eternally. I know it's been settled. I don't have to worry about it. I understand all that. But when you understand who we are as a nation and what we were really intended to be as a nation, then you get a whole lot better picture. And I don't think we can operate correctly if we don't have that understanding. And in the culture in the world today, we have that, that has really been lost around us. So here's our objective in the message this morning. We want to examine how God deals with nations and peoples. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is not rocket science or brain surgery to any of you here because he's never changed the way he deals with nations and peoples. He does it the same way he always has, and he will continue to do it the same way he always did until the end of this age that we're in. We're going to examine the foundation of our country. Like I said a second ago, if you don't understand the foundation, if you don't know who you are and what your purpose is, then you will float around without any vision, without an aim, without a desire at the end of the day of what you should do. We want to learn the events, and just a few of them, that caused, I believe, a very negative reaction here in America. And I'm going to go back and look at four Supreme Court decisions that have happened in the span of my lifetime, and I was born in March of 1951. So in that short period, really is short, 61 years, doesn't seem short to me, but it is. In that period of time, I'm going to look at four Supreme Court decisions. We could probably look at 40 or 100 or more, but just four that have, I believe have caused the protecting hand of God to slowly but surely lift off of our nation. We want to examine the spiritual implications of the current direction we're on, where we're going, because if we don't understand it and we don't try to change it, uh, I guarantee you where it's going to end up. 
And so that's really part of why I'm talking about this at this point in time, right before an election. And we want to look at, above all, not what, but who the only solution is to America's problem. Because America has a sin problem, that's pretty obvious to us. America has a lackadaisical, apathetic problem inside the churches, that's pretty obvious to us. So we want to look at who the solution is, and of course that solution is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to talk about the wonderful obligation and responsibility that we have as Christians to do our very best to vote according to the scripture. Now, the people that I would like to see running for president never got in the race. I mean, they were in for a little while, but they never got in the finals in the race. And, uh, you know, if you're wondering what to do, you have to vote according to your conscience. You have to decide to do what you're going to do. I can't tell you. Pastor doesn't want to tell you. We're not here to try to guide you, but I am going to tell you this. I think you ought to look at the goal beyond just who we put in the White House and decide who's going to give us the best judges because that's really the big prize. It really is. Who will give us the best judges? Who will give us judges that my grandkids can live with their decisions? Because I'll be long gone when some of those judges are still in the federal jurist system, when they're still in the Supreme Court and the federal judges that are all across our country in other positions of power. My grandkids will have to live with those decisions that are going to be made because I believe we could have as many as four Supreme Court justices replaced in the next eight years. So we have to look at that. And I think we need to vote according to the scriptures, vote according to our responsibility. One of my co-hosts on Understanding the Times, Jill Martin Rishi, she's the daughter of the late, great Dr. Walter Martin. She said, you know, if we only have one talent left, if you look at the parable of the talents in the Bible, she said, maybe that last talent is common sense. So we have to use common sense. You know, I've threatened to write my dog in for president. But I think I want to use common sense instead. Now, Jeremiah chapter 6. Great instruction for Israel. Too bad they didn't take God up on it. And great instruction for you and I, because when we read the, the Old Testament passages, folks, we always read them with the understanding or the illumination of New Testament Christians. As the New Testament guides us, we read the Old, and it comes to life for us. Jeremiah chapter 6, thus saith the Lord. That means drop everything and listen. Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where is the good way and walk therein and you shall find rest for your souls. Man, what a great word of instruction from God. And God's not asking us here to go back to the Stone Age, but he's saying if you're at a crossroads, see which way I am and walk after me. And this is really what the saying, the old paths, where is the good way and walk therein. In other words, where is God? Where is his holiness? Where is his righteousness? Walk after him. But sadly, Israel in those days and America in this day said, but we will not walk therein. They decided to ignore God and be hard-hearted and stiff-necked. So God said, also I set watchmen over you, saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. It was always a sound of information and warning to the Israelites. When the trumpet blew, they, they stopped to listen to see exactly what sequence it was going to be, and they knew whether it was a sound to come together as a meeting for the family to join together or whether it was a sound of warning that attack or enemy was on, on the prowl and getting ready to, to invade them. It was a very important thing. But the people said, we will not walk therein. They decided to do their own thing. So God says, therefore hear ye nations and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words nor to my law, but rejected it. And with it, we reject God. Now, that's God speaking. One version of the scriptures about verse 19 here says that he would bring disaster upon the nation. I know that goes against the grain of what some of you maybe have been taught because in, a, in modern Christianity, we say, oh, God would never do that stuff. That's the devil doing that. I got news for you. God uses evil people to judge those who decide to abandon him. And that's the pattern we see in the passages in the Bible. He uses evil people to judge others who decide to abandon him. And God has given plenty of warnings. We could give you a lot more of them, but this is one to start with. 
God has a sovereign standard, and his sovereign standard for a nation is very simple to see. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. That's not over any school child's head. If you live right, it'll go good with you, and if you abandon God, it won't. What do we not understand about that? But of course, every person is in their own microcosmic spiritual warfare. We're all in a warfare with ourselves, with our flesh. We're in a warfare against enemy forces, against the enemy himself, demonic powers. We're in a war. And people don't want to follow God always in the middle of that war. This passage ought to be on every bumper sticker and every billboard across America. How I'd love to see this going down Meridian here. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Now, early in my Christian walk, I learned to read the scriptures in the converse or opposite meaning to try to extract more depth from them. This is a great passage you can do that to. It would read like this. Blessed not is the nation whose God is not the Lord and the people whom he will not choose for his own inheritance. Pretty easy to see. We have choices. One path leads us to righteousness, holiness, purity, salvation, eternal life. And the other one goes the opposite direction. Which one will we choose? The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. So on and on, the scripture warns us of what happens to people individually and collectively when we decide to follow the wrong path. Now when you look around America today and you see the proliferation of evil, and it doesn't take uh, very much imagination these days, you don't have to go too far to figure that out, in the travel I've done, and by the way, next week I will enter my 30th year of full-time traveling ministry and doing what I do a couple hundred days a year out on the road. And I have seen a proliferation of evil in our country in that period of time, and easily we could all become desensitized to it, but it doesn't take, I mean, you don't have to go very far in research to figure out that there are 10 times more porn shops in our country than there once were 20 years ago. And you look around, you see all this, you see the, the open acceptance of evil as good, calling good evil and evil good, Isaiah chapter 5 warns us about it. You see all that, you wonder, well, why hasn't God just dropped the hammer on us? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but I'm just going to give you two of them that I think are primary to the argument, the conversation here this morning. Two reasons why I believe we still exist today as a nation. Number one, we are to this point in time still the number one supporter of Israel in the world. And when we stop supporting Israel, there won't be jet planes fast enough and tickets you can buy to go far enough away to get away from what God will do. I believe that with all of my heart. No, I'm not saying Israel's perfect. No, and they're not following after God, at least many of them. But they're still God's chosen people. And they are still the apple of his eye. And we, according to the Bible, are grafted into them. That's why when I hear Christians speak in an anti-Semitic manner against Israel, manner that I, I, I mean, it boggles my imagination when I hear Christians talk down to Israel. The whole of the world's attention is being drawn to that little tiny sliver of land smaller than the state of New Jersey. And by the time it's all over, they will be the only ones standing by themselves. I don't know what will cause America to stop supporting them. But at some point, they'll be all by themselves. And God will supernaturally protect them and keep them. And the whole world's attention will be at them and against them. But yet God will uphold them. So we are still the supporter of Israel, even in the weakened state that we're in today. I'm worried. Concerned is the better word. Christians aren't to worry, but I'm concerned about where we're going. I'm concerned about us turning our back on Israel. And the second thing, the reason I believe that we are here today, because God is very, a very practical God, and he uses people and he doesn't drop manna for us to eat anymore. And he doesn't fill our bank accounts up supernaturally by his hand. He uses others to do those things. And to this day, we are still the catalyst of world evangelism, which is exactly what the founding fathers envisioned for us to be. A lighthouse to the world to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. And we are still doing it. And for the last couple of hundred years or more, we have been the main engine of world evangelism from America. When I say we, I mean the church in America, not America as a government, but the church in America because of our freedoms and the way God has blessed us, 
We have sent and funded missionary endeavors to the world like no other nation in the history of the world. And so many have been saved. So many have been blessed. So many have been healed. So many churches have been built. So many missionaries are today out there on the field in very dangerous places because we gave. And that's, by the way, in our weakened state. Because the average Christian in America only gives 3% to all charity, including his church. Only 3%. And that according to, to uh, Larry Burkett before he passed away, the famous Christian economist, and George Barna, both said the same thing independent of one another. Just think what could have happened and how many more could have been saved and how many more would not already be in hell if the church had been giving 10% and then we were sending and funding more missionaries to the world and more Bibles and more DVDs and more tracts and more information and more understanding. Think what could have happened if we'd have been doing that all these years. But even in our weakened state, just giving 3% of our income, think what we've already done. Now, I don't want us to pat ourselves on the back. Okay, I'm just pointing out what we could have done if we'd have gotten serious about it. Hmm. You say, oh, that's uh, that Old Testament uh, tithing business. Don't talk to me about that. That's legalism. I'll give what God lays on my heart. Really? Well, guess what? In the New Testament, God owns 100% of what you have. You'll be glad to go back to the 10% 10, 10 of the Old Testament, won't you? Every time somebody wants to argue about that, I go, look, that's a starting point. That shouldn't be a finishing point. That's a starting point. You've got to start somewhere, but that's a finishing point for some people, and that's not right. <laughs> this, see, this is exactly what the founding fathers envisioned us to do. They didn't want another situation like the Church of England. They didn't want a state religion. They're not, they didn't want us to be a theocracy. That wasn't what this was about. But they want us to have the freedom of religion, not freedom from religion, which is exactly what we hear being pushed by our courts today. The freedom of religion, the freedom of worship. All others are welcome. Just don't try to make America into your own theocracy for your own God or your own cause. This is what we were founded to be and founded to do. With that understanding, what was America founded for? You've got part of the picture already, but on what are we founded? Well, at least 50, but possibly as many as 52 of the 55 most influential founders or framers of America weren't just believers in some sort of an impersonal deity or a God force. They were real, live, evangelical-style, Bible-believing, born-again Christians, and most of them were Episcopalian or Presbyterian or Dutch Reformed. And this is easy to document, even though there are some, even in the church today, who want to denigrate this and run this down. But it's easy to document this. There's no doubt about that. These were people who understood who God was. They weren't confused. They weren't talking about some impersonal God force. They were talking about the God of the Bible. Now, the University of Houston, not exactly a theological organization... Back in the 1980s, they examined 15,000 documents that the Founding Fathers left us. That was every document they could find that was, had its origin in the Founding Fathers. And from those 15,000 documents, they decided that, that about 3,100 of those documents, or about 20%, were the most influential documents of America, the most important ones. And from those 3,100 documents... 34% of the quotes in these documents were direct quotations from the Bible by our founding fathers. And 60% of the rest of the quotes and writings were biblically based in their orientation or their morality. And from this, the secularists in our culture, like the ACLU, want us to deduce that the founding fathers were obviously agnostics. There wasn't one quote from Buddha. There wasn't one quote from Confucius. There wasn't one quote from Zoroaster. There wasn't one quote from Muhammad. There wasn't any quote from any other religious book except the Bible. What does this tell us? I hope it speaks to you. Now the Supreme Court, the most powerful people in our land, the Supreme Court by far more powerful than the president, those nine people that are put on the Supreme Court that are, that are appointed there by presidents, 
back in 1892 on leap day of leap year, February 29th of that year, in the Holy Trinity Church case versus the United States, the Supreme Court said our laws and institutions must necessarily be based upon and include the teaching of the Redeemer of mankind. Wow. Now, the court, of course, would have been called ludicrous had the ACLU been around today. Can you imagine how the talking heads on the TV news would be going crazy, going, oh, this is a terrible day. This is a day that'll go down in infamy. I can hear them say something almost like that, like Franklin Delano Roosevelt said the day that, that we were attacked at Pearl Harbor. You, you can imagine what they, they'd go nuts about this. They'd say, oh, the Supreme Court have lost their way. They're Neanderthals. You can... You can kind of imagine, can't you? Because the ACLU would go nuts on that kind of statement today. But you know, the Supreme Court didn't make that an arbitrary decision based on their own beliefs. They used precedents, as every court should. They used a previous precedent in a court case or something that was important in our common lives here together, and they cited 87 precedents in making this decision in favor of the Holy Trinity Church case, or a case, uh, in that case, versus the United States. And these are some of the precedents they used. The Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, because they all talk about a God. And they talk about God being creator and supreme judge. Again and again, we see this in our foundational documents. Now, they cited several of the state constitutions. I'll just give you two of them for the sake of time this morning. One was the Constitution of Mississippi, ratified in 1832, and it states, No person who denies the being of a God or a future state of rewards and punishment shall hold any office in the civil department of this state. And then Mississippi, right with the word religion on the screen there, begins to quote the Establishment Clause of the U.S. Constitution, as many of our state constitutions do. It says, religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government, the preservation of liberty, the happiness of mankind, schools, and the means of education. I emphasize that. You got that, didn't you? shall forever be encouraged, the Mississippi adds, in this state. Wow. But think what was said in the Constitution of Delaware, Article 22, ratified in 1776, having all public officials affirm that they believe this, I do profess faith in God the Father, in Jesus Christ his only Son, and the Holy Ghost, one God, blessed forevermore, and I do acknowledge the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be given by divine inspiration, end quote. And to my knowledge, that is still in the Constitution of Delaware. And I could go on, but you understand, they made a decision based on precedent, the Supreme Court did. Back there in 1892, Justice David Brewer wrote the decision, and he said, these and many other matters which might be noticed add a volume of unofficial declarations to the mass of organic utterance that this is a Christian nation. I didn't say it. No other preacher said it. No theological organization said it. The Supreme Court said it. And if they said it, that settles it. This is a Christian nation. Amen. That's not been struck down. It's just been ignored. And as long as something's ignored long enough, eventually it doesn't matter. But that's what's happened to us. Now, the court renders the best ruling possible based on the information that it's given that's available at any time of a decision. So if the court in 1892 was going to make a decision based on science, by 1992, 100 years later, they might have a lot better science to work with. But in the case of the founding fathers and what they said, they had all the information that would ever be available. Do you know why? Because all the founders were dead at that point in time. And all their writings have been kept and preserved and uncovered. They knew exactly what the founders said. And the Supreme Court made the right ruling when they said this is a Christian nation. They knew what they were doing. They made the right ruling because they had all the facts. Every one of our state constitutions talks about a God, the supreme ruler of the universe, the providence of God, almighty God, almighty God, creator, sustainer. You get the idea. Every one of our state constitutions has this kind of statement in it. You get here to, to Washington. What does it say? Washington says, We, the people of the state of Washington, grateful to the supreme ruler of the universe for our liberties, do ordain the Constitution. This Constitution. Over and over again, we see this in the state constitutions. Each one of them speaks of a God. 
Look at what the presidents and others have said throughout time. And by the way, Woodrow Wilson certainly isn't my favorite president in time. No, he was a globalist by the end of his time there in, in public office. But when he was the governor of New Jersey, he said, America was born a Christian nation. America was born to exemplify devotion to the elements of righteousness, which are derived from the revelations of Holy Scripture. Calvin Coolidge, while he was the president, said the foundations of our society and our government rest so much on the teachings of the Bible that it would be difficult to support them if faith in these teachings would cease to be practically universal in our country. Eisenhower said without God there could be no American form of government nor an American way of life. And a very liberal jurist, Justice William O. Douglas in the Supreme Court, one year after I was born, said we are religious people whose institutions presuppose a supreme being. Earl Warren may be the most liberal jurist on the Supreme Court during the, the uh, 20th century. He said, I believe no one can read the history of our country without realizing that the good book and the spirit of the Savior have from the beginning been our guiding geniuses. Warren went on to say, I like to believe that we are living today in the spirit of the Christian religion. I like also to believe that as long as we do so, no great harm can come to our country. Wow. And Reagan... Reagan said the founding fathers believed that faith in God was the key to our being a good people and America is becoming a great nation. Previous to that, he said, I believe with all my heart that standing up for America means standing up for God who has so blessed our land. We need God's help to guide America through stormy seas, but we can't expect him to protect America in a crisis if we just leave him over on the shelf in our day-to-day -day living. I say Reagan for president 2012. <laughs> what about the founders they surely weren't perfect but when you read what they wrote especially the way they ended their lives up the way they came to conclusions at the end you can't miss their dedication to the Bible it cannot be emphasized too strongly and too often that this nation was founded not by religionists but by Christians not on religion but on the gospel of Jesus Christ you know a famous statement this man said because in the same speech he said give me liberty or give me death and that was Patrick Henry responsible for the Bill of Rights a patriot not a founder but a patriot a short time later said the patriot who feels himself in the service of God who acknowledges him in all his ways has the promise of almighty direction and will find his word in his greatest darkness a lantern to his feet and a lamp unto his paths he will therefore seek to establish for his country in the eyes of the world such a character as shall not make her not unworthy of the name of a Christian nation you probably sung a song he wrote the Star Spangled Banner Francis Scott Key made that statement. America's Constitution was made for moral and religious people. It will not work for any other people. Ah, oh, now's the key of why judges know that the only way they can rearrange the way we are as a nation is by ruling from the bench, not through legislation. Because they can make decisions that are not following precedent and not following legislation from the bench. Our Constitution was made for moral and religious people, said John Adams, second president, who was right in the middle of the fray and putting our Constitution together. The highest glory, in other words, the reason for the American Revolution was this, that it connected in one indissoluble bond the principles of civil government and the principles of Christianity, the two mixed together. Who said that? Sitting on his father's knee, John Quincy Adams, sixth president, watched as our foundation was put together by the founding fathers. We have staked the future of our American civilization not upon the power of government, far from it. We have staked the future of all of our political institutions upon the capacity of each of us to govern ourselves, to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. Do we see anybody thinking about the Ten Commandments today but a few Christians? And many of them don't? Who said that? He was called the father of the Constitution, James Madison fourth president of the United States. Look at this one. This flies in the face of the, the current wisdom that's out there. Do not let anyone claim to be a true American if they attempt to remove religion from politics. 
Now, when, when Bush and Gore ran against each other back in 2000, Nadine Stronson, who was the president of the ACLU at that point in time, said that nobody should be elected if they had a strong religious belief and believed in a God. I'm glad she wasn't around pulling the strings back then and that he was because George Washington made that statement. And you know, Washington has taken quite a hit as of late. So has all the founders, even in Christian circles. As I pointed out a few minutes ago, they weren't perfect. They were men. They were fallible. They didn't always make the right decisions. They certainly weren't all Christians. Many of them were Freemasons. And many of us who understand Freemasonry understand that's a secret society. And one that we should not as Christians take part in. But some of them were Freemasons in those days. And Freemasons even to this day claim Washington as the grand architect of America. Claiming that he was their own. But was he? Was he? You know, Washington lived a short life when you get down to it. 1732 to 1799. Not very long. Well, once again, I appreciate you watching and I appreciate you commenting. Uh, I, it would be great to hear where you're watching in the world as well. And uh, if you want to send an email, you can do that just by finding the email Eric button at our website at ericbarger.com and you'll be able to email me personally. I'd love to know uh, where in the world you are watching. Uh, please tell others about the broadcast. Please share the broadcast if you're watching on Facebook uh, live streaming on Facebook. You can share the broadcast. Of course, you can share them just by sending the YouTube uh, information to your friends and family as well. But uh, come join us next Monday as we live stream. Remember, next Monday, not Tuesday, as we live stream on Monday next week. Normally, it's Tuesday at 9 a.m. and 7 p.m. Pacific time in the United States. Uh, next week, remember, I'm going to interview or play the interview from a formerly purpose-driven pastor, a friend of mine from Bakersfield, California, a church I've spoken in several times. Rock Harbor Church is the church. Brandon Holthouse is the pastor, and he's going to tell his story about coming out of the Purpose Driven Movement and why he did that. So join me next week. I believe it will be an uh, encouragement to you and a challenge to you as well. You don't want to miss uh, next week's program. So this is Eric Barger. Once again, thank you for joining me. And uh, in a few minutes, we'll begin the second part of the Rise, Fall, and Redemption of America. Thanks for joining us for Take a Stand TV with Eric Barger. We welcome your comments and questions. Please visit us at ericbarger.com. Be sure to tell a friend and please join us again for more Take a Stand TV with Eric Barger.